Good evening. Welcome to Questioning Christianity. Uh, my name is Justin Adore. I am one of the pastors at Redeemer, and I will be hosting uh, this event tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. We are glad that you are joining us here. Uh, we are currently streaming this live event from a remote location uh, in compliance with the city's efforts uh, to limit, of course, the spread of COVID-19. Uh, now, Christi Questioning Christianity is a five-part series uh, from Redeemer's Family of Churches uh, where we seek to host and provide space for our friends uh, who are not Christians to process their questions about the Christian faith with us. Uh, and in an effort to encourage many of you that are out there uh, in this really unprecedented time that we find ourselves in, uh, we've also invited others uh, from around the world to also listen in uh, to tonight's talk. Uh, because of the many struggles that many of us are experiencing right now, we've decided actually to pause the topic that we had initially intended to have for tonight's series. Uh, we were going to be looking at the topic, Can We Live Without the Church? Um, if you were wanting to hear that discussion, don't worry, we will be having that discussion uh, later on in the series next month, actually, on April 16th. Uh, you'll hear a little bit more about that later. Uh, but tonight, what we're going to do, what we've decided is to use this time to consider what the Christian faith has to say about how we can have peace in the midst of suffering and uncertainty. Now, Redeemer is a community that has been in New York City for 30 years. Uh, it has always sought to be a safe and hospitable place where people uh, can come from a variety of different backgrounds to explore Christianity. And as we think about the topic for tonight in particular, over the years I have uh, personally wrestled a lot with the questions that we'll be considering, particularly around uh, what we do with suffering and uncertainty. Uh, questions about, uh, questions and doubt that come for me have certainly over the years uh, been related to things like the historical and the theological and philosophical claims of the Christian faith. Um, but probably more often than not, questions and doubts have been related, not so much at times those things, but sometimes for me, it's been about the experiential things that I experience. You know, how will I get through difficult and painful seasons of life? God, where are you in the midst of suffering and pain? Maybe you have those kinds of of questions. Maybe you've asked those kinds of questions in the past, and maybe you're asking them right now. And these questions, and many like them, are why we have this forum, Questioning Christianity. The Redeemer is also uh, desiring to engage people even beyond these talks, and one of the ways that we do that is through our Questioning Christianity groups. Uh, where people have an additional space to explore and to process the questions uh, that go beyond tonight. Uh, these groups are eight-week uh, peer-led discussion groups that meet in people's apartments around Manhattan. Uh, they happen over food and over drinks, where people have the opportunity to explore similar topics that we are exploring in this series. Uh, and even though right now we are currently not meeting physically, uh, we still would encourage you uh, to email us at qc at redeemer.com for more information so that when the ban is lifted and we're able to gather again, uh, we can give you more information about where and when those will be happening. With all that said, let's get started tonight. Uh, since we're streaming tonight's session live, uh, there will only be two parts to our event tonight. There will be a lecture and then we'll shift to a Q&A time. Uh, if and when it is safe to gather again in person, uh, our future sessions will resume in the ways that we have been doing this in the past, which would uh, be to not only have the lecture and the Q&A, but to also have a time afterward to have further conversations with food and drink. Again, we're hopeful uh, and praying that we'll be able to experience that once again. Uh, as far as the Q&A goes later on, you can text your questions to the text in number that was provided to you in your registration form. Uh, for our New York City friends who are exploring uh, the Christian faith, feel free to submit those questions uh, as Tim speaks tonight. 
You can go ahead and send them in uh, right away with a number that you were provided. Uh, we'll also uh, eventually just we'll try to get to as many of those questions as we can tonight. And I would just encourage you with this. Uh, it makes for a much um, a better Q&A time if we can make sure those questions stay on topic. Uh, I know that there are a multitude of questions that might come up, uh, but there will be future uh, opportunities uh, to engage with some of those questions in some of our future sessions. Uh, and for those of you that are listening to us uh, our, as our guests uh, here in the city, um, around the world, we encourage you to listen in and to uh, enjoy the questions that are asked for tonight. Uh, now let me introduce our speaker for this evening. Uh, Dr. Timothy Keller was born and raised in Pennsylvania. In 1989, he started Redeemer Presbyterian Church in Manhattan with his wife, Kathy, and their three sons. He is the author of multiple uh, book publications. He is probably best known for his New York Times bestseller, um, The Reason for God and Making Sense of God. Would you please join me in welcoming Dr. Timothy Keller? Welcome to my home. And uh, you are in my living room, which is where so many of us in our uh, world today are doing so much of their work. And um, I'm glad to have you here. Uh, Justin already, let me give you a little back, more background. Justin already explained that uh, this is Questioning Christianity. <clears throat> Questioning Christianity is a place where we explore the plausibility of belief in God in general and belief in Christianity in particular. And we do that in, in full light of the most um, serious objections and doubts that people have about Christianity. So it's a place where we talk about whether Christianity is plausible, credible or not, and we, we try to give every uh, uh, bit of emphasis on, on the strongest possible objections. And what we were going to do, the topic tonight was going to be, how can you be a Christian and believe in light of all the wrongdoings of the church? throughout history. That's a very, very important topic, and we have to get to it, and we will. We'll get to it in the future. This is a series of five monthly uh, sessions, but it just wasn't appropriate in considering how the world has changed in the last week uh, to, uh, to talk about that. Instead, we are talking tonight about how do you find peace in the midst of, uh, in the face of suffering and anxiety? And <clears throat> we're not gonna look at it philosophically so much. Um, <clears throat> two months ago when we talked about whether we believe in God, we, we talked about the, the problem of believing in God in light of evil and suffering. I mean, how can a good God allow evil and suffering? That's a very important philosophical issue. Um, and that's the background of what we're going to talk about tonight, but it's the, here's in the foreground. We need not to look at evil and suffering philosophically. We need to look at it practically. How do you actually face it what, what do you actually do in order to, to move forward? That's the question. And what we're gonna do in light of questioning Christianity uh, is we're gonna look at what the various religions and worldviews and cultures over the years, centuries, how they have equipped their members to face pain, suffering, loss, and anxiety. And then we're gonna take a look at what Christianity has to offer. So we're gonna compare the worldviews and <clears throat> that way we're gonna get down to practicalities, and I think that's something we all need. So let me start, let's just ask the question, why is this important? Then what do the various religions and cultures of the world uh, give you in order to help you face, and give you peace, face, in the face of uh, suffering and loss? And then finally, what does Christianity have to offer? So first, um, very briefly, the reason why this is important anytime, now of course we're doing it now because because the world has changed. But it's always important to have a working, a, a, a working way to handle evil and suffering because it's inevitable. You know that very famous line in Macbeth, Shakespeare's Macbeth, where it is said, each new morn, new widows howl, new orphans cry, new sorrows strike heaven upon the face quite eloquent, quite striking, and right. Each new morning, new widows howl, new orphans cry, 
new sorrows strike heaven on the face. Sorrow is inevitable, but for a moment, just for a second, let me talk about where we are today. In the past, most human beings understood that suffering was inevitable, that life was nasty, brutish, and short. And they knew, human beings knew that famine, pestilence, war could any time just sweep through their country and append everything. And so everyone knew life was fragile. Everyone knew if suffering was inevitable. I would say that today we have lost some of that sense, especially since World War II. There is a, a sense that says, hey, <clears throat> our societies are high tech and we're, and we're globally connected. So that sort of thing doesn't happen anymore. But now here's what we've learned. If you're high tech and connected, new sorrows can strike you on the face. New problems come up because of high tech, because we're so connected. The reality is life is fragile. Suffering is inevitable. And therefore, there is absolutely no way that you're going to be able to make it in life unless you've got a working theory for how to face this stuff, how to face pain and suffering, uh, how to face it well, how to face it in a way that you grow through it, how to face it. Uh, Ernest Becker, who wrote the great uh, Pulitzer Prize winning book, uh, the, uh, the Denial of Death, he's got a place where he says this. He says, quote, I think that taking life seriously means something like this, that whatever we do on this planet has to be done in the lived truth of the terror of creation, of the rumble of panic underneath everything. Otherwise, it is false. Uh, In other words, to be honest and serious about life is to realize there's a rumble of panic under everything. And the idea that if we just, if we've got it sorted, if we go to the right schools, if we're savvy, if we've got enough money in the bank, if we're careful, our life is going to be a designer life. That's just not true. Each new more new widows howl. Now, let's take a look uh, at four kinds of, you can say religions, cultures, worldviews, four historic ways that human beings have been uh, taught to handle suffering. First of all, let's talk about karmic religions. Now, karmic religions, yes, religions that believe in karma, Karmic religions are religions that believe in reincarnation. They believe that when you die, your soul migrates to another body and to another life. And you are, uh, you are being judged by how well you live, which means that if you have lived poorly, if you've been cruel, if you've if been immoral, if you've been a bad person, then uh, in the next life you may suffer. If you've been a good person, the next life you may do well. And eventually, you try to, uh, by living rightly, you get off of the cycle of birth and death. And eventually, you go into the all soul of the world and you go into the bliss of nirvana. Now, here's what the karmic religions think about suffering if you're suffering, it's because you are suffering now for something you did in a past life, which means there is no unjust suffering. It's a very interesting <laughs> philosophy of life. If you are living a life of privilege, it may be because of something good you've done in the past, past life. If you're living a terrible life, it's because of something bad you've done, which means there's no such thing as unjust suffering. And I guess you could say the karmic religions would say that the strategy toward suffering is one of resignation. Uh, whatever Whatever you're experiencing right now is perfectly just and fair. And I may give you a little bit more detail because Buddhism has always been fascinating to me in that Buddhism was actually born as a response to suffering. In fact, it's really, it's a, it's a religion that is there in order to deal with the problem of suffering. It's not a sideline. It's not a tangent for Buddhism. Um, <clears throat> according to a Buddhist uh, tradition, the Buddha was originally, his name was uh, Gautama uh, Siddhartha. And Siddhartha was a prince and he grew up in a, a very uh, uh, posh palace. And at one point he left his father's palace and went out into the world and he saw suffering. And he had what was, what's been called the four distressing sights. Uh, The four distressing sights, he saw a, uh, he saw a sick man, he saw an old man, he saw a dead man, and he saw a poor man. And he recognized suffering. And at one point, uh, Siddhartha f- sat down under the Bodhi tree and contemplated trying to understand the, um, 
uh, the, the, uh, the, the riddle of suffering. And when he arose, when he got enlightenment, he arose and he was called the Buddha, which of course means the awakened one. And he enunciated the four noble truths, which is the Buddhist understanding of how to handle suffering. So number one, the first noble truth is that life is suffering. Uh, Buddhism is really realistic about this. Life is suffering. Uh, do not think that you're going to avoid it. It's filled with suffering. The second noble, noble truth, though, is that suffering comes from desire. Uh, craving and desire. Uh, suffering is the distance between what you want and what you get. See, so you have desire, and our desires always fall short of what we actually have. So what we want and what we have, there's a gap, and that's where the suffering is. Suffering is that. So the first noble truth is life is suffering. The second noble truth is that suffering comes from craving and desire. The third noble truth is that the way to overcome suffering is to extinguish desire. The way to do that is to, is to decrease or dis extinguish those, those cravings. And the fourth noble truth is actually, it's, <laughs> is that the eightfold path to enlightenment. And enlightenment means you overcome desire when you realize that the world is an illusion, that you, the fact that you are an individual ego is also an illusion, that all the things you see you have but you don't have, it's an illusion that those things are different than you because reality is we are all one. And there is no uh, soul, uh, individual soul, but we're all part of the all soul. And um, uh, we are like a dewdrop, we're like a raindrop, which goes into the sea eventually. And it loses its, it doesn't lose its being, but it loses its individuality. And uh, so Buddhism says the more you see that basically you are one with all things, uh, that extinguishes desire. Or put another way, is Buddhism would say, do not engage in the love of, of attachment, but in the love of compassion. So be compassionate, but let things go. Don't attach yourself to anything. Uh, and therefore, uh, the, you would say the Buddhist strategy toward suffering is one of detachment. So the karmic is resignation. The Buddhist is, no, 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 you don't resign yourself. You, you change yourself so that you detach and you recognize more and more that you are one with everything and so you lose these desires. Uh, a third approach would be the shame and honor culture. Shame and honor cultures uh, have existed throughout history. They still exist, especially in certain parts of the world today. And the meaning of life in a shame and honor culture is that you be strong and noble and that you sacrifice yourself for the good of your tribe or your family. That's the meaning of life. And in the shame and honor culture, which is the warrior culture basically, uh, suffering is almost welcome, <laughs> almost, because it's an opportunity for you to sacrifice yourself for others. It's an opportunity for you to be strong. By the way, it's not a, an accident that in, uh, you, know the, you know those How to Train Your Dragon movies? Uh, the Viking father is named Stoic, and that's because, because the shame and honor culture says the strategy you use for suffering is stoicism. Don't let it get to you. Keep a stiff upper lip, you know, say, be strong. There's stoicism, <clears throat> there's detachment, there's um, resignation. Now, let me just say something brief. Those are ancient cultures. And have you noticed one thing? All of them say the way to handle suffering is to accept things the way they are. Not to try to change things. Not to try to... Uh, uh, you know, rebel against suffering and injustice, not to rebel against the way the world is, but to accept it and learn to accept it, and then, then you'll be able to handle suffering. And uh, the, the, the modern idea that we need to change things came from Christianity, which I'm going to try to show you in a second. And I'll get to more next month if you're able to uh, be part of, what we're, of our uh, event next month. But for now, let me jump to secularism. So we looked at karmic religions, we looked at Buddhism, We've looked at shame and honor cultures. They were all ancient. And now let's look at modern secular society. Now, modern secular society, uh, what do I mean by secular? Well, secular society either does, says there is no God or if there is a God, God does not do miracles. There is no supernatural. Uh, everything here has a scientific explanation. Uh, secularism says really the only real world is the here and the now, the material world, the physical world. Now, how does that handle, how does secularism help you handle suffering? Richard Schweder, 
who is a very well-known cultural anthropologist, has written a number of times that modern secular culture is the worst culture in the history of the world at equipping its members to handle suffering. He says the problem with secular culture is it has actually no strategy for helping people handle suffering. And that modern people, modern secular people, have the most trouble, far more than Hindus, far more than Buddhists, far more than shame and honor, far more than everybody. Um, Pico Iyer, who is a, 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 a writer, a, a British trained writer who lived for many years in Japan. If you go on the internet and look up some of his, uh, he's written some memoirs. He's left Japan now, but he lived there for many years and taught there, I think. Uh, and he points out the fact that he found that when the tsunami came or, or various suffering came, he was so surprised that the Japanese were much more able to take suffering in stride than modern Western people. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Rich, uh, pardon me, Paul Brand. Dr. Paul Brand was a, uh, uh, a very well-known pioneering ortho orthopedic surgeon who worked in the treatment of leprosy patients. And he, he was British, but he spent half his medical career in India and half his medical career the last half in the United States. And this is what he wrote. <clears throat> he said, in the United States, I encountered a society that seeks to avoid pain at all costs. Patients lived at a greater comfort level than any I had previously treated, but they seemed far less equipped to handle suffering and far more traumatized by it. Now, why would modern secularism have a, why would it be so bad at preparing us for suffering? Terry Eagleton, uh, he's a you know, British, uh, Irish, I think, literary critic, wrote a little book for Oxford University Press called um, the Meaning of Life. It's, a, it's, it's called The Meaning of Life, A Very Short Introduction. It's a wonderful little academic book, but it's very short. And one of, the, one of the things he says is, modern secular people, in a sense, have freedom to choose any meaning in life they want. See, all the religions tell you what your meaning in life is. They all tell you, this is what you have to live for. But secular people, we can choose whatever meaning in life we want. There's freedom, Terry Eagleton says. But here's the problem. Whatever we choose in life, it's got to be something in this world. It's going to be a romantic relationship is our meaning in life, or our family is a meaning in life, or, uh, or a career is a meaning in life, or some political agenda is our meaning in life. And the problem, of course, is that suffering takes away those things completely. See, every other religion or every other culture has always said the meaning of life was something outside of this world. So either the meaning of life was going to heaven to live with God and your loved ones forever, or the meaning of life was escaping the cycle of reincarnation in order to go into eternal bliss, or the meaning of life was escaping the illusion of this world to go into the all soul of the world, of the universe, or uh, the meaning of life was to live a moral, virtuous, honorable life in the face of defeat and doom. But in every case, every other culture said the meaning of life is something outside of this life, which means when suffering came along and took things away from you, it couldn't touch your meaning in life. And not only didn't it touch your meaning in life, it actually could enhance it because it gave you an opportunity to develop more detachment or more valor or uh, more faithfulness to God. In other words, every other culture always said, if suffering comes, it can actually enhance your meaning in life, as painful as it is. But modern people, because they have to find their meaning in life in this world, that's the stuff that suffering takes away, stuff from this world. And as a result, we've got, secular people have got no real, um, they've got no ability to handle it. They've actually got no safety in the world from suffering. Now, what we, uh, just, just to summarize here, uh, secularism, however, does feel like we ought to push back against suffering. And when suffering comes, we ought to weep and cry. And the other uh, the other views of the world actually don't say that. They say, no, you accept it. You don't push back against it. And you don't weep. You have to be strong. Where does Christianity fit in here? I'll show you. Let me just, let's just take the last part to talk about this. What does Christianity have to offer? Well, a lot. Um, Luke Ferry, in his book, uh, A Brief History of Thought, points out something that actually you can find in other history books. And that is one of the things that made Christianity in the, its earliest days so attractive in the Roman Empire 
You know, why did it grow? It, well, there's a lot of reasons. But one of the reasons was what Christianity offered to people uh, to help them handle suffering. Because uh, the Roman world was filled with a lot of the things we've already talked about. So Cicero and Seneca were Stoics. And what they taught was you shouldn't attach your heart to anything. Uh, Epictetus, uh, the Greek philosopher Epictetus, says that when you kiss your little boy, tell yourself, well, you know, you might be dead tomorrow. So be compassionate with your little boy, but detach. Don't, you know, don't, don't invest your heart too much in any one thing. Uh, so you had the shame and honor culture, uh, which was be strong. You had the stoic culture, which said detach. And the average person found that very cold, very, very cold. Along comes Christianity, and Christianity gave the world three things that it never had before. It gave that culture, that ancient culture, three things it never had before in order to handle suffering. And it actually offers three things to you and me right now that secular culture doesn't offer. And here's the three things. The first thing is Christianity offers a God, presents to you a God who came into this world and suffered. No other religion says anything like that. Christianity says God in the person of Jesus Christ came into this world and died on the cross, suffered and died for us. Now, the reason for that we will get to later in this series. But for right now, do you realize what this means? Um, this God is personal. And this is the only God that, of any major religion or of any worldview I know who says that as Jesus Christ, he experienced unjust suffering. Take a look at Jesus Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane. Take a look at Jesus Christ on the cross. He's crying. He's crying out. He's not stoic. And he's experiencing injustice. And there's never been a, a, a faith that's actually said, unjust suffering is real. See, the karmic religion says, no, it's not real. Yes, it is. And we have a God who, if you turn to him, if you're a Christian and you have a God, you turn to him, he knows what you've been through. If you've lost a child, God the Father's lost a child. If you've been betrayed, if you've been rejected, if you have been uh, uh, the victim of, an un uh, of injustice, Jesus Christ has experienced that. And so we have a God who has not only experienced injustice, but it gives us a warrant for saying, no, you don't resign yourself to, this, to the suffering of this world. You can fight against it. And you also can cry out. You don't have to be stoic. So first of all, we get a God who has actually experienced unjust suffering himself. Secondly, we have a promise that of an afterlife, which is a world of love. Karmic religions say that you can get off of the, the cycle of reincarnation uh, if you live a good life. But when you become part of the all soul, you lose your personality. You don't stay as a person. You become part of the all soul. And Buddhism, of course, says it's an illusion that you are a, a person. You are actually part of the all soul. Now, here's the problem with that. That means that after life, even if you believe you continue, there's no love there. And the deepest desire of the heart in suffering is not to lose love. Um, there's a, a very, very famous Japanese poet uh, from the 18th century, Kobayashi Issa. I'm probably mispronouncing that. Could be Issa, but Issa. And uh, he's known for his haiku poetry. And he wrote a very, very famous poem, that I, haiku, that I'll give you in translation in a second. But first, let me uh, uh, give you the background. He experienced a lot of tragedy in his life. In 18th century, of course, people are going to get sick. He saw his mother and father died, but then he saw uh, his children start to die. And in the very end, he lost two infant children. And he wrote a poem about it. And this is what the poem says. It's very famous. Now, this is English translation. And so follow me. It's going to be three short lines, OK? The world of dew. A world of dew it is indeed. And yet, and yet. The world of dew. A world of dew it is indeed. And yet, and yet. Now, the first two lines are a brilliant summary of the Buddhist approach to suffering. Because what is a dewdrop? A dewdrop is a shimmering, beautiful thing. It's shimmering and beautiful, but it's evanescent and fleeting. It doesn't last for long. 
And when it goes into the pond or when it goes into the lake or goes into the ocean, it doesn't lose its being, but it loses its individuality. And when Esau, when, uh, when he was losing his children, of course, he knew that what Buddhism said is detach. Don't, rem don't, don't forget, those, those children are not really individuals. They are just going to be part of the all soul. And so you have to let go. Don't, don't hold on. Uh, don't yearn for their love. Just recognize that you know, you, we're all going toward, you might say, we're all dewdrops going into the ocean. But look at that last line. The world of dew, a world of dew it is indeed, and yet, and yet. It's like he's saying, but this is really hard. In fact, maybe it's impossible to stop yearning for the resumption of a love relationship. When somebody dies, there's no deeper desire than to say, you know, after death, I want there to be love. I want to be with my loved ones. I want to be with a God of love. And of course, Christianity offers that. Uh, Christianity, unlike Buddhism, unlike karma, uh, karmic religions, what it says is this. Yes, if you love someone and they die, then of course that, that just that destroys you. But the answer is not to love them less. Don't detach from people. Don't love them less. Come to love God the most. So that w his love is the consolation so that when you do lose people, you can, you can bear it. And you can know that if I have the love of God, that means that when I die, I will be part of a world of love. I'll be with my loved ones. I'll be with God himself. And so what Christianity does is it gives you a promise of future personal love, uh, unimaginable love, love infinitely greater than any love you've been, you have here. I mean, Christianity doesn't say you're just going to be part of the all soul. You're going to be an impersonal force. You're going to be sort of stardust in the universe. No, it says that's not the yearning of your heart. The yearning of your heart is for love. And the future after death is, is one of love. So it, first of all, it offers a God who experiences unjust suffering and who understands what you're going through and gives you a basis for fighting against it. Number two, it gives you the promise that whatever love you, let, you lose here, there is a love in the future through faith in Jesus Christ that is, uh, that is available and is unimaginable. And thirdly, the third thing it offers is the idea of a resurrection. Um, the, do you realize what the resurrection means? The resurrection means that we're not going to live forever kind of ethereally, you know, as, as sort of uh, floating like ghosts or something like that. The resurrection is that God is going to create this, recreate this world and he's going to wipe it f uh, free of all suffering and all evil and all death and all imperfection. And what's <laughs> the promise of the resurrection is a promise not just that when you die you go to heaven and you get a consolation for the life you've lost. Oh no, Christianity offers much more than a consolation for the life you lost. It promises the restoration of the life you lost and more. It, it promises to give you the life you never even had here on earth because of all of its imperfections and fallenness. And so let me just summarize. Unlike karmic religions, Christianity says, no, a lot of suffering is unjust, and you can fight against it. Unlike the Buddhist religion, we would say, no, suffering is real, and the solution is more love, not less. Unlike the shame and honor um, relig uh, cultures, it says, no, uh, don't just be stoic, you may cry out. And so let me just finish this way. If you actually get into the Bible and you say, okay, how do you take this, these doctrines, this, uh, the promise of a God who suffered, the promise of a, of a world, a heavenly world of love, the promise of resurrection, how do you actually use that to face the troubles that we have? And let me just give you quickly six things, six steps, you might say, that, are, um, uh, that I think the Bible gives us, and uh, not in this order, but here they are. Uh, and I'll, I'll pair them. First of all, you should weep, but trust. You should weep, but trust. One of the most important things about the book of Job is you see Job never turning away from God. And yet, the emotional realism is amazing. Just read that book. He's, he's questioning, why did you ever let me be born? He's, uh, he says, I don't understand why, what's going on. There's an emotional realism. 
But in the end, he stays faithful. And because he says, you know, in the end, of course, there has to be a God. Otherwise, there's nobody to be mad at. Of course, there has to be a God. Otherwise, there's no, there's no right and wrong. Of course, there has to be a God. Or, I mean, who's to define evil, for goodness sakes? And yet, at the same time, there's this emotional realism. I, I guess I, what I mean by that is a lot of people say, well, if you trust God, then you don't have to, you, you shouldn't be too upset. And the answer of the Bible is, oh, no, 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 no. You trust God, and yet you can be really upset. Jesus Christ said, thy will be done, but he was crying out on the cross. So you weep, but you trust. Secondly, you pray, but you think. Now, when I say pray, here's what's most interesting about the book of Job. Years ago, I remember reading this book for the first time and finding it very difficult to understand. Um, Job was, was, seemed to be complaining the whole book. Uh, he seems to be questioning God the whole book. Well, I don't mean he seems. He is. He's questioning God. He says, why are you doing this to me? Why are you allowing this suffering in my life? Why is all this happening to me? And at the end, God shows up, and he actually says, Job, you have done well. And I remember thinking, wait a minute. How, hey, why would God say that? And I had an Old Testament professor who was teaching the book of Job, and he says, ah, yes, Job was crying out. He was yelling. He was screaming. He, you know, he was, he was you know, chewing on the rug. But he was doing it to God. He never stopped praying. All that complaining was in front of God. And so pray, no matter how bad you feel, but think. And what you see in Job is he's, he's, he's struggling because there's places where he says, ah, I don't know why God's doing this, but after you've tested me, I will come forth as gold. And there's other places where he said, well, I, but I know my Redeemer lives, and that on the last day he will stand on the earth. He goes back and forth. He's thinking, he's remembering, he's, uh, he's wrestling, but he's also praying. And that, take a look at the book of Psalms. At least a third of the Psalms is like that. So weep, but trust. Pray, but think. Think about the fact that you don't see everything like you should. Think about the fact that only God can see the big picture of what's really going on. And then last two, reorder your loves and hope. Now, when I say reorder your loves, uh, this, is, this would be a whole talk on, my, on its own, but I guess I'll just say this quickly, is very often when suffering hits, you have to rearrange your priorities. You look at life and you say, you know, these things are way, way too important to me. I mean, it's a bit of a joke, and I'm sorry to say this, but because uh, I am a pastor and I have talked to people on their deathbed, and uh, I want you to know that on their deathbed, nobody says, oh, if only I had spent more time at the office. Nobody does that. Um, and they, when, when you're about to die, you look back and you, 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 your priorities start to change. Okay, well, suffering gives you a chance to change the priorities now. And therefore, reorder your loves. What th maybe you love some things more than you ought to. You know, you should not love your career more than your family. If you do that, you're going to lose not only your family, but probably your career. So reorder your loves, and lastly, hope. And by, by hope, I mean the things I, we just talked about real briefly, uh, about the heaven as a world of love and the resurrection. Here's just a couple of interesting quotes. Um, you know, uh, one of my favorite places in the Lord of the Rings, not in the movie, but in the, uh, in the book. In the, thir in the third book, you know, Sam Gamgee discovers that his friend Gandalf isn't really dead. Uh, as he thought, but he's alive, and what Sam says is, Gandalf, he says, I thought you were dead, but then I thought I was dead myself. Is everything sad going to come untrue? And you know, to some degree, I'm saying this carefully, and I'd have to qualify it, but if you believe in the resurrection, yeah, everything sad is going to come untrue, or put it this way, that the world that we long for, that we were designed for, will eventually be more infinitely glorious for all of the suffering and for all of the evil once it's restored. And therefore, yes, everything sad is going to come out true. The other thing is, this, this fascinating, uh, this is out of Dostoevsky. There's a place where uh, one of the Karamazov brothers says this, and I'll close with this. I believe like a child that suffering will be healed and made up for, that all the humiliating absurdity of human contradictions will vanish like a pitiful mirage, 
like the despicable fabrication of the impotent and infinitely small Euclidean mind of man, that in the world's finale, at the moment of eternal harmony, something so precious will come to pass that it will suffice for all hearts, for the comforting of all resentments, of the atonement of all the crimes, of all the blood that has been shed, that it will make it not only possible to forgive, but to justify what has happened. That's the ultimate defeat of suffering. And I believe as a Christian, that is what's being offered to me, and I think that's what Christianity offers to you. So Justin, um, please come on up here and tell us what we're doing next. Uh, thank you, Tim. Uh, so what we're going to do now is we are going to transition to our time of question and answer. Uh, but let's shift over to some of these questions. Uh, Tim, we've had uh, several questions coming in, uh, particularly about uh, Islam and Judaism. So you named quite a few other uh, worldviews and world religions. Uh, where do they fit into all of the, uh, the, the spectrum of things that you've described? Well, the reason I, I left Judaism and, and uh, Islam out is that they, obviously, they're monotheistic religions. That is, they believe in a personal, infinite God. Uh, and therefore, their approach to suffering isn't quite as different than Christianity. Christianity obviously has a, um, a pretty interesting relationship with both of them because Judaism, uh, three-quarters of the Christian Bible is the Hebrew Scriptures. And... <clears throat> uh, so, for example, those three things that I said that uh, Christianity offers that's so unique. One is a God who suffered unjustly, and therefore that gives you a, a real strong uh, warrant for pushing back against injustice in the world. Well, neither Judaism or uh, Islam believes that, of course. Secondly, the uh, idea that the future is personal um, that the future is uh, love relationships in the future, that you don't uh, go into the all soul, but you, you keep your personality, which I think is a wonderful thing that I think deep down inside we want to believe. I mean, whether, I mean, I obviously did not, I haven't uh, all by itself made this strong case for why Christianity is true. I'm just trying to show you what it offers tonight. Nevertheless, uh, both Islam and Judaism believe that. Uh, Judaism it depends. Now, some of those of you who are Jewish know that uh, uh, certainly are, there are plenty of Jews today that actually don't believe in much of an afterlife at all, but the reality is that historically, take a look at the book of Daniel and other places uh, in the uh, Hebrew scriptures, there are definitely indications that there's an afterlife and even that there's a resurrection. But they, uh, so Islam doesn't have an understanding of the resurrection. So you take a look at those three things, the, uh, uh, the God who suffered, uh, the personal uh, continuation, a uh, heaven is a world of love, and the resurrection. Islam doesn't have number two or number th number one or number three, uh, and Christian and Judaism doesn't have number number uh, one, and so that's the reason I I could have gotten in there, but it first of all has only had so much time, mm -hmm. and and therefore they overlap. That is, to, I, I am not here saying that there is no. Um, that, that the other religions besides Christianity don't give you any help. Uh, frankly, let me just let me be honest personally, Buddhism, even though I think in the end, I think the idea that you must avoid attachment love, I think that's a great mistake. I think that I think that's uh, that's that's very wrong. But Buddhism takes very seriously that suffering to a great degree comes from egocentricity. That suffering is a, is inevitable, that uh, a calling to live a life of compassion and not of selfish craving. There's a lot of things that Buddhism offers. So, I would say only secularism gives you no, almost nothing. But I mean, one more thing. Since we're comparing for a minute, uh, Islam and Judaism have some of what Christianity offers, not all of it. And I think it's also fair to say secularism has something that Christianity offers. I, I alluded to the fact that I want to talk about this later, but uh, if you read a book like Tom Holland's book, Dominion, or Larry Seedentop's book, uh, Inventing the Individual, or a number of other books in the last few years, a lot of secularism's moral values come from Christianity because secularism grew out of Western culture, which was originally much more Christian than it is today. And the idea that you should 
you should care for the poor and you should help the suffering and you should push back against injustice. Those are ideas that did not arise from karmic religion, from Buddhism, from honor and shame cultures. They came from Christianity. So even secularism has something to offer, which is let's fight against suffering. But I would say of all the different approaches, I think Christianity offers you the most resources and secularism the least. Uh, so just to this idea, so you're in the comparing different religions yeah. um, and the uniqueness of Christianity and all of that. One question is this, is that Christianity says that we are suffering because of original sin, because of something Adam and Eve did in the beginning. How is this fundamentally different than the uh, karmic view of suffering as a result of past doings? Uh, well, now listen, that's uh, touche. That's a great question. Okay. Um, it is similar. It is similar. Uh, and uh, not all the way, though. So, for example, now this is, this is actually kind of fun, I have to say. Tonight, rather than saying who's right and who's totally wrong, I'm, I'm, I'm making comparisons. And I am... I'm always going to be trying to recommend Christianity to you. You know, that's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to say that uh, if you compare the idea that, that we suffer for something we did in Adam, if that's like karma, that's partly right. Here's what I mean. Uh, let me just uh, summarize what Christianity has always taught. Christianity teaches that God created a representative. Uh, now, listen, if you're elected to be a representative, you go to Congress, or if you're an ambassador, you go to another country, and you try to represent the people who sent you. And you'll never represent them perfectly, right? You can't, you, but you're trying to represent them. But God created a perfect representative so that when Adam sinned, basically, you cannot say, oh, if I was there, I wouldn't have sinned, because he was a perfect representative. So there's a sense in which you sinned in Adam. And in that sense, yes, it's like karma, but here's the difference. Uh, karmic religion would say the, the relationship between your individual suffering and your past sin is perfect. And we would say, no, that's not true. Uh, what we would say is rather that, there's a, that in general the world has fallen and there's a great deal of uh, trouble in the world but there are some people who suffer very directly because of things they have done, and there's other people who actually uh, are just suffering as part of the fact that the world has fallen. Uh, so we would not say, for example, that, uh, uh, I mean, there are poor people who are being oppressed. The, the word for poor in the Old Testament, one of the main words for poor, ani, is a word that actually means the oppressed ones. And so what, they, what the Bible, the Old Testament says is poor people are very often mistreated. They're not treated as they deserve. Uh, and rich people who also sinned in Adam are having wonderful lives. And poor people who also sinned in Adam are having terrible lives. And that's not, that's not justice. So there's a sense in which it's true. And I, I would say, and I didn't say this because this is a little bit of a bitter pill for many people to swallow. I am sometimes comforted by the fact that when suffering goes happens in my life, I sit there and I say, but I'm not a perfect person. I am a sinner. I have done wrong. Uh, and I don't deserve a great life. And therefore, I, I must be grateful to God for all the good things he has given me. So that actually has been a help to me. I didn't mention it, but it's been a help to me. Nevertheless, Christianity does not say there's a one-to-one -one relationship between your past sin and your present suffering. Never. Uh, if, if you say... For, let me give you, let me give you the, the, uh, the best example. If somebody comes to me as a pastor and says, I'm really suffering, I guess I'm, I must have done something bad that God's punishing me for. And my answer is, okay, have you seen Jesus Christ? Do you see how much he suffered? And he, he didn't deserve any of it. And the reality is there's plenty of people that suffer in this world and don't deserve it. And so, no, it's, uh, I said, maybe, I, you know, obviously, if you work too hard and you get an ulcer, and you're suffering because you overworked, well, then that, that is a case where sometimes sin does result in suffering. But there is not a one-to-one -one relationship. That's the whole idea. We're not like karmic religions where there's a one-to-one -one relationship between uh, whatever you experience and how you lived. There's a lot of injustice in the world. So it's, it's partly right, and I would take some comfort in the fact that as a sinner, I don't deserve a perfectly good life, and therefore I'm more grateful for the things I have. I don't, I don't say, oh, God, why aren't you giving me more? But at the same time, it's not that one-to-one -one relationship. That's a great question. Well, related to that, I think um, it's appropriate then to 
So related to that, someone asked, someone asked this question, and I think it's related to how you just framed that one, mm -hmm. is why do some Christians say that if you're a Christian, then you shouldn't suffer because God king, God's kingdom has come? What do you respond to that? And I think maybe specifically to this idea of um, Christian suffer. If you're a is Christian, you, you sh if you've become a Christian, now God will not let something really bad happen to you. Right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. You know why people say that? Because they are badly mistaken. I, mean, I, 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 Jesus Christ was the best person who ever lived, and he suffered a lot. And uh, there is no, um, uh, there's, there's. In fact, I think we have to go this far. Uh, by and large, most Christians would say that because of their, their pride or because of their stubbornness, most of us would say that the best lessons we've ever learned were uh, through some, some difficulty coming into our life that kind of woke us up. Uh, unless something, unless, if you have, a, frankly, if you have a, a really charmed life, if everything goes well, you're gonna be a shallow person, you actually won't know much about your own strengths and weaknesses, you'll take credit, because that's the natural thing the human heart does, we take credit for all the good things. When good things happen, we say it's because we were smart. When bad things happen, we say, God, why did God allow that to happen? Um, and unless troubles come into your life, you actually don't grow and mature. And, and therefore, the idea that if you become a Christian, God will only let you suffer a little bit, but not too much, it just isn't true. Look at Job. By the way, let me just, here's, I, let me go back to Job one more time. What if God had showed up in the middle of all of Job's suffering and, and said, Job, you're suffering, it's just terrible, I, I, it's really bad. But I want you to know something. If you just hold on and are patient through the suffering, thousands of years from now, millions of people will know your name. They'll read your, 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 your story. You will be one of the most famous people in the history of the world. You will help untold hundreds of millions of people. So all you have to do is hold on. Now, if God had done that, he would have said, oh, okay, all right, I'll just hold on. This is great. And of course, at that point, he would have actually not been the suffering would not have turned him into a stronger person, a more faithful person, a humbler person, a person more devoted to God. It would it would actually said, "Oh, I can get a lot of I can get a lot out of this." It would have made him a more selfish person. And so, a lot of times, suffering that is pretty hard and pretty bad, and doesn't seem to have a particular reason, can be one of the best things. It's really why at one point Job said. After he's tested me, I will come forth as gold. You know how gold goes through the fire. Uh, so it's, it's just terribly wrong for people to say, if I'm a Christian, God won't let bad things happen to me. They will. He can. He's got purpose in it. If you're a Christian, there will be always a reason for it, even though you may not see it, and you may not see it this side of heaven. Uh, okay, so again, related to that. Okay. Um, so one question came in that said this. Should one adopt a worldview, or maybe we could say a religion, yeah. such as Christianity, yeah. because it's useful for facing suffering, or because it's true? And related to that, can we know if a worldview is true, or can we only know if yeah. one is more utilitarian in, its, in this hard world than another? That's a wonderful question, too. Thank you. Uh, uh, <clears throat> You should never believe in something only because it seems useful. In fact, I just gave you that example. If, if, if God had shown up and said to Job, if you just, if you just stay patient and faithful to me, then someday you'll be the most famous person, one of the most famous people in history. At that point, God would have been undermining the very idea that Job was being faithful to him. Job would have actually been pursuing his own, uh, his own selfish uh, ambition. So what that means is, if you um, simply pick up Christianity because I think this is useful, it really won't be useful to you. Uh, be, in what, the brilliance of Christianity, the usefulness of Christianity, is when you say, I'm not doing this because it's relevant, but because it's true. So I, I, I think this might be behind the question. I, this is the implication. If Christianity is true, then it will be relevant to you. Don't believe in it because it's relevant, but because it's true. Now. Having said that, why did I just spend one entire evening not talking about whether Christianity was true, but re really wh whether it was filled with resources? And the answer is, 
I don't believe that unless you see the, the resources Christian, Christianity has, that you will frankly take the time it takes to find out whether it's true. Or it, I get this from Blaise Pascal, Pascal the wonderful uh, French mathematician. Uh, he wrote a book of sort of a Christian sayings called Pensees, and there's one place where he says, he says, people will have to wish Christianity were true before they find out that it is true. Now, you're going to say, well, then isn't it wish fulfillment? Uh, yeah, you have to be careful about that. But the fact is, why are you going to spend the time it takes to look at whether Christianity is true if you don't see it as relevant at all? Uh, I would say at this point in my, in my life, when I look out at, at American culture right now, most, I think, people have no idea about the resources for Christianity. But if I show it to them, I don't want them to say, okay, give it to me. I say, wait a minute, Look, listen, sometimes Christianity is not going to seem like it's working for you. And at those times, that what's going to get you through is a belief that it's true, whether it feels like it's profitable to me or not. And actually, I see the irony of it? Because Job didn't stay patient um, selfishly, but just simply because God is God, and I owe it to God. That's what actually made him into a great man. If he had said, oh, okay, I'll trust God in order to become a great person, he wouldn't have become a great person. He would have been a small, little, selfish person. But because he said, I want to trust God and not care whether it makes me a great person, that's what made him great. So the relationship between the truth and the relevance is uh, it's important. They, you need to see both. Uh, most of us usually see the relevance before we see the truth. Otherwise, we're not motivated to find the truth. But once we find the truth, we know it's true whether or not in a, 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 in a given time or moment or year, it's relevant. So then, as a follow-up to that, another question that just came in, because it seems to me like people are more likely to find Christianity through suffering. Those that are content and doing fine in life are less likely to yeah. look for something else to fill a void. Would you agree or disagree? Yes, but I want to, yes. Okay, I hate to say it yet, but yes, but I've seen people <clears throat> uh, in the early days of Redeemer, I had people who were suffering. By the way, in 1991, there was a terrible recession. It started with the stock market crash in October of 87, which was the, the month I started coming up here to, uh, to uh, explore starting the church. So the month I started, the stock market like lost, I don't know what. And when I, we started the church, there were a lot of people out of work. And there definitely were people that showed up and said, I'm hurting. My egos hurt. I mean, they didn't say it this way. Their egos were hurting because they, they didn't think their career was uh, ever going to be put back on track, and they were just needing community, and they were needing God. And, and uh, some of them uh, got involved and seemed to believe, and when their lives started turning around, they went away. Uh, Jesus actually talks about that in a, a he calls it the parable of the soils, and he talks about the kind of person that uh, that um, you know starts out good, but then it sort of goes away. And I think in that case, well, here's what I think they realized it was Christianity was relevant, but they didn't do the hard work, intellectual work to decide it really was true. Uh, I I should say this because I don't know where else I'm going to say it. Most of the time, the way it works is you have a need, just like you said. Something goes wrong in your life, and you say, you know what, I thought I was self-sufficient, I'm not. So if you don't get rid of that illusion of self-sufficiency, you know, why, why do you need God? So something happens that breaks the illusion. And then, so you see the relevance of Christianity. Then you actually do the hard work to, discuss, to look at the Bible, to take, do the hard questions, to look at the evidence, and decide it's not just relevant, it's true. And once you decide it's true, and you actually start to have a relationship with God, then you begin to have an experience. Now, that's a difficult thing to explain on this, on the outs from the outside, but it means the reality of God starts to, he becomes real to you. As you're reading, as you're thinking, as you're praying, you do sense his presence, and he does show you things, and he does illuminate you. So from relevance to truth to experience, so that at certain points, Christianity does not pay off. It doesn't seem to be working for you. But your, both your experience of God's reality and your intellectual conviction about the truth holds you in there until it becomes relevant again. So it's relevance to truth to, fa to experience. And those three things together basically make Christianity seem, you know, I, I mean, in other words, I, 
the uh, the the plausibility and truth of Christianity to me consists of all th oh, three of those things. Years of seeing its incredible relevance and all its resources for life, years of thinking through all the possible objections and the arguments for it, and years of experience and prayer with with God's th that I could never explain other than there really is a God. You put those three things together and then there's a solid basis for faith. Yeah. Uh, shift gears a little bit. Uh, Good. Related back to a couple of things you, you mentioned in your talk. Um, we had several questions. One in particular put it like this. Uh, I don't understand the point about resurrection, hmm. specifically about what exactly is restored in the afterlife in the face of the suffering in the present life. Can you expound on that more? Well, th yeah. Um, first of all, the... <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm sorry. I have no idea how that sounds over the microphone. Um, Jesus' resurrection body, Jesus is the firstborn of the dead. That's what the Bible says, which means what the resurrected Jesus is, a, it shows us what we're going to be like in the future. Now, in some ways, the problem we have is that Jesus was resurrected without the rest of the world being renewed. Now, Romans 8 says that the world is going to be renewed. All of nature is subject to decay. And somehow, even nature is going to have all of its, uh, uh, you know, all of its imperfections taken away. Nevertheless, so you have the risen Christ. Read the accounts of the risen Christ. What's intriguing, by the way, is mo when most of the time when people saw him the first time, they didn't recognize him. They're on the road to Emmaus, they didn't recognize him. Mary Magdalene didn't recognize him. That is really weird. In fact, a number of historical scholars say. Uh, that's a that's a that's a testimony to the truth of the resurrection narratives, because uh, if you're making up a resurrected person, you either would have made him a, a luminous divine figure where he was glowing, or it would have just been a resuscitation, so that as soon as you saw him, okay, there there he is. But j somehow Jesus was changed, um, and yet. And yet, it was still him, him. He still had the nail prints in his hands. It would be a little bit like, you know, if I, Justin, if I, if I hadn't, if you and I were the same age, which we are not, by the way. I, I know it's hard to believe, but we're not actually the same age. I'm a little older. Uh, but it, let's just say we were, we were friends when we were 10 or 8 or 9. And then we don't see each other, and we get back, and we're 30 years old. And at first, you'd say, hey, Tim. And you say, do I know you? I say it's me, it's Justin, and I would look and I'd say, "Oh my, it is Justin." So there's something somehow. It's like it's like you get the body, that is. Um, it's you, but it's it's a, it's the perfect you. It's some it's some kind of major major change. It's also interesting that Jesus ate a fish, and yet he he passed through locked doors. Twice in the book of John it says the doors were locked and he appeared. And yet when everybody thought he was a ghost, he says, give me a fish and he eats it. Even that is so weird. If you're making these stories up, if you're trying to make up stories of a resurrected being, you don't, you don't do that. That's why most historians say these really have the, the ring of truth. And what it, what it, when I had thyroid cancer, uh, I read a big, big book on the resurrection. I'll talk about it um, later. I mean, if we... if, if God willing, if we have a May meeting, I'll talk about it then. Uh, because, you know, when you, when you have cancer, you wonder about the future. And the book showed me that there is uh, basically that my deepest desires, whatever those things are, are going to be fulfilled in the new heavens and new earth. Uh, it's not just going to be a, uh, a kind of ethereal, uh, disembodied experience like I think almost, almost every other religion except Judaism and Christianity talk about. It's going to be very much a this worldly experience. We're going to hug, we're going to dance, we're going to make music, we're going to love. Uh, now, in light of the, the loss and suffering, all I know is that it would make up for it. I, I, I think it will. I think it will make up for it. And I think we'll also have a certain perspective on the past and saying, and I see how in the end it only made this new heavens and new earth more glorious. But that's as far as I can go. I can't. I couldn't possibly give examples. So. so, does that mean that we then we have no recourse 
in the midst of suffering. And it, it, the reason I ask that is someone asked this, this question. If Christianity is true, then what does that mean that the virus, the endless wars, etc., cetera, uh, are designed by God to make us suffer and that we are yeah. powerless to stop any of it? Yeah. Doesn't that just make it, doesn't that make you want to not believe that this is true? Well, I mean, you know, it, again, let me, sorry to keep coming back to the book of Job. It's a very strange book in some ways because um, <clears throat> it's interesting that in the book, and I, of course, I, I know that the, the Bible is talking to us about concepts that are almost beyond our ability to take in. So it does use symbolic language sometimes. But it, it depicts Satan um, trying to show God that, 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 Satan, that, that, that Job is actually a, a charlatan, that he's a fraud. And in the end, Job defeats Satan. And God, you know, restores everything. But it's interesting that God, it doesn't, doesn't, de obviously God is in charge. But uh, l let me say something that may be a little bit, uh, let me say something pretty nuanced. God does not relate to evil the way he relates to good. Uh, the uh, theologians, even, even theologians, like Reformed theologians, which is our, are uh, my church that really believes that God is in charge and everything that happens happens according to plan. Uh, the Bible talks too much about how he, he, he doesn't like to see anybody die. He doesn't like to see anybody suffer. It talks about that all the time. And what that's got to mean is that there is a, there is a, a permi there, he's permitting a lot of this. That's the reason why in the book of Job, you don't see God actually uh, giving Job his disease. Satan does it. And yet, of course, God could stop it. And therefore, in the end, no, of course, you wouldn't say God's out of control. I wouldn't want him to be out of control. What I want is, frankly, after all these years of thinking about it, this is what I want. I want a God who, in his wisdom, has not ended suffering yet. He insists, and I hope we can take his word for it, he insists he's still got reasons, things he's getting done, um, and that's the reason why he has not stopped it yet. So he, has, he hasn't ended the world yet which means to stop all evil and suffering. I can understand a little bit about it. I mean, obviously, evil and suffering does change people's lives. Um, all, bad things that have happened to me, almost all, almost all of them are things that... that yeah, I mean, when a bad thing happens, God's got 10 billion good reasons for it, and we can see almost none of it. But he doesn't relate to it the way it relates to good. He doesn't say, ha, there you go. He doesn't actually cause it in the same way. I, and I'm... By the way, I'm a... I'm a Reformed theologian, some of you know what that means, and I do, I, I, uh, we, we believe God is in charge, but he does not will evil things the same way he wills good things. I'm actually an infralapsarian Reformed theologian, but let's not go there. <laughs> that gets, let's not okay. go there, yeah. I, Okay, but anyway, the point is uh, that, no, I, 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 under, I understand the struggle, of course I do. You read the book of Job, you're allowed to feel this way. Whoever asked that question, you are, in Christianity, you're allowed to feel this way. You should not, you, don't let any Christian scold you and say, no, 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 you mustn't wonder why in the world God is allowing this thing. You mustn't, have, you mustn't have dark, bad days where you wonder, you know, why should I believe in a God who allows this? But I, I, here's what I say. I, um, to believe in a God who hates suffering has allowed it because he, thinks he's, because he says he's going to bring greater glory and good out of it in the long run who says, trust me, I can see things that you can't. That's, that's in the end consoling to me, even though on a given day, I can feel exactly the way that questioner feels. Uh, so of course you've touched on Job quite a bit. Uh, Did both I? Both in your talk and of yes. course now. Um, and something that you mentioned in your talk was that uh, so much of Job is, is a prayer. So he's, he's talking, to, he's talking God to God in the midst of all of this. Uh, and so this question, is what is the role of prayer when it comes to suffering? And am I supposed to be yeah. asking God to take away the suffering? And, well, I'll, I'll follow up to sure. that, but let me start there. Okay, let's, uh, we, have one, we have an example in Jesus. Very short prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. He says, Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. Now he's talking about, the word, cup was a word in Semitic language that meant an experience. And usually it meant a bad experience. So when you talk about this cup, this bitter cup, you're talking about some bad experience. And so Jesus, before he goes to the cross, he actually says, 
it's pretty remarkable. He actually says, Father, you know, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy be done. And there's, there's the, your, your perfect balance. I mean, he, Jesus was the perfect human. And so what he's actually, uh, he does not say, well, Lord, you know what? It's all fated and it's all predestined and, you know, why should I even ask? I think it's amazing. Don't you think, Justin? I mean, it's amazing that Jesus Christ, because he, he was hurting. He was, he was hurting. He was crying out. He was, he was a real human being. And he was shrinking, as it were, before the, the, uh, uh, the prospect of what he was going to go through. He was going to go through physical and spiritual suffering like nobody's ever experienced. And so his natural human cry is, is there any other way? You know, is there any, is there any way? So please uh, find some other way so I don't have to do this. And then he says, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. That's exactly where Job ended up. Now, Job spent 40, you know, 42, you know, 42 uh, chapters of iambic pentameter. I mean, talking about... Uh, and going back and forth, and uh, Jesus was perfect, and yet what's interesting is even this Jesus, perfect human being, cries out. You know, he uh, he's uh, he's hurting. He's really hurting, and I think that just shows why we can combine those things. We can combine the prayer of really, honestly saying, "Lord, please change my situation." At the same time, but if not, please get me ready for whatever you're going to do in my life through it. I, I, you know, my wife and I pray every night for plenty of things that worry us, and uh, we may not always say it exactly that way, but that's the balance we try to strike. Yeah. So, as a follow-up to that, then yep, I knew it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, in your in your talk, you you spoke about um, weep but trust, pray but think, hope. That there's yep. all these things that do assume um, a certain belief. Yeah. So yep. you're 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 trusting <coughs> in something, you're hoping in something, you're praying to someone. Right. Uh, so of course, because many of our many of our friends who are here listening, they're not, they're, yeah, they're not there. How do, how do they process? What does that mean for them to pray to something that they don't, at least not yet, believe in? Well, I yeah, that's right. I <clears throat> I I have had folks who did not believe yet or believe, and then I said. Read some passages of scripture. I mean, get, get your... Now, the trouble is you've got to be very careful. If you don't know the Bible and you just open it up and say, I'm just going to read something, you might get stuck in Leviticus. All right? And so uh, if you don't know what the word... If you don't know the, the book Leviticus, I don't, please don't go there first. But, but Pastor's joke. Y yeah, it is a pastor's joke. <clears throat> but get some friends to give you some consoling and uh, vivid scriptures that have words of comfort. Uh, and uh, and then actually, here's what you do: read it, and then say, "God, I have no idea if you're there, uh, and I'm not even sure I know what you should be doing. But here's the things I don't know if you're there, but here are the things I'd love you for you to do, and here's the way I would, if you could, please reveal yourself to me. And I don't think you sit and wait for a voice. By the way, of course, I'm Presbyterian. Um, and uh, no, no, no. Anyway, so never mind. Let's not go <laughs> rabbit trail. Yeah. Rabbit trail. Rabbit. Uh, there are there are there are Christian traditions in which they do say yes, yeah, sit around and wait for a voice. I guess in all honesty, I, I can't say you should do that. Uh, there have been times in which God actually did give me such a sense of His presence that I would feel it was every bit, every bit as uh, vivid as a voice. But I wouldn't say to, I, I would say that generally the uh, for most people who have trouble believing, it's a it's a process. That's all. So I don't see any problem with, with reading some consoling scriptures and asking God uh, presence, help, thoughts, um, reality. Uh, the, beyond that, the, other, the thing to do, as I'm trying to say to you, is move from, if you see the relevance, then let's start talking about the truth, whether it's true or not. Yeah. Uh, again, maybe shifting a little bit, but you know, mm -hmm. we are, we're here for a reason, right? So we're we're mm -hmm. streaming for a reason. Yeah. Uh, we've changed our topic for a reason. Uh, this is yeah. not uh, just some hypothetical thing that we're dealing with. There's a real problem, season of suffering, yeah. disorientation. I, I, that <coughs> word has just been coming back to me uh, lately. Just <coughs> disorienting, so disorienting. So given where we are with this uh, pandemic, uh, how do we avoid panic? during this epidemic? 
And how should we look at suffering during this time, this specific time? And how do we love and be loved in a time of no contact? So what does this look like to to actually be caring for one another and yeah. providing hope for one another in the midst of this really disorienting season? Well, wow. Um, well, if I let, let me just be selective and take a couple of those things I just talked about, you know, uh, weep but trust. First of all, when I say weep but trust, I'm saying uh, don't let anybody tell you you shouldn't be anxious. Of course you should be anxious. And yet, I, I mean, even, how do I say this, even at a humanistic level, uh, the human race and, and, and entire societies have been through much worse than this. Uh, and, and I mean, even the worst scenarios are still not quite what, uh, uh, we still, we're still not having World War II right now. I mean, if you were in Europe in World War II and you just had armies just going back and forth over your country, you know, and fighting back and forth. That's that was a, and yet they survived. France is still there. Germany is still there. Austria is still there. Belgium is still there. Uh, so I mean, even at a humanistic level, you could say, you know, God is not finishing the world yet. And uh, and so, you know, don't trust, but weep. But let me just let me give you something else here. Um, remember, I talked about reordering your loves. Mm. I said, well, how does that relate to this? I had a thought here. We in the Western societies, I think we're very proud. And we looked at uh, all the troubles that were happening in Asia and we said, that's not going to happen here. I'm almost sure of that. I, I mean, I, I believe that the reason why, I don't think we should blame our leaders much because I think our leaders are part of the entire Western world that sort of says, oh, those people, those are, those are backward countries. They're not really modern countries. You know, they eat bad things. Um, they're, 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 uh, Pushed together in these big cities, it's not going to happen here. That's that, that was just arrogance. That was pride. That was racial pride. And I think, um, and I think we all participated in it. I think I did. I didn't think it would happen here. Uh, and uh, I think one of the things in suffering is you actually are supposed to reorder your loves. You're supposed to say, "I'm not thinking right. There, there are priorities I haven't had right." So you weep, you trust, reorder your loves. Here's. Uh, uh, Another thing is, somebody said, what does it look like to, what, love one another in a time mm -hmm. like this? In the time of no Yeah, look, rights. I've got, so for example, it doesn't, love is love. It just takes different forms. So, for example, after 9-11, as many of you might remember, uh, the churches were jammed with people. Redeemer, by the way, Redeemer had 3,000 people coming to church every Sunday, and then the, the Sunday after 9-11, we had 5,400 people in church. And people came together, and everybody, want, everybody wanted to be with each other. And people who didn't believe at all said, uh, I just want to go to church, I want to be with people, I want to pray. Everybody came together. This is exactly the opposite. But let me give you an example. I got two children, who, they have two, I have two sons in the city, and they are both trying to do full-time jobs, and all their children are home with them. It's very hard on them. Okay, now ordinarily, grandparents would say, oh, I can help you. you know, we'll, we'll help the kids, okay? And the point of the matter is that both of my sons and their wives have said, we're going to love you because you're 70 years old, or we'll, Kathy and I will be 70 this year. You are, you are in the risk area, and we're, even though it would be wonderful, we are not letting you do that. So basically, they are loving us by refusing our offer, as it were. And uh, now that's weird. You might say, no, it's not. It's just how, it, love is love. It just takes different forms. And so you're going to have to find there's always ways to love. At the very least, call people up. Find out how they're doing. Uh, I've had a number of people out of the blue just call me that I haven't talked to in a while. Mm. And they've been wonderful calls. Mm. And they're, they're short. Mm. And so anyway, they're, they're fi you'll, you'll find a way to love. Yeah, the great but irony has been the best way to love people is to Stay away well, from in them. that case, yeah, I'll give you a perfect yeah. example. Uh, we, we feel guilty about not helping them out. We're grandparents. You want to, yeah. and besides, we love our kids. Sure. And if they were saying, we're going to love you by saying no. Uh, but see, all those things, the weep, the trusting, there are ways of, of doing those things in every situation. Mm -hmm. Maybe just this last question. Okay. I think it might be a relatively easy one for you. Um, oh, thank goodness. <laughs> but, but I think it does actually play into what you were just describing about the 
the kind of Western arrogance that we can that we can have. So uh, my roommate says she can go to Disneyland and travel and won't get coronavirus because Purell and God is protecting her. Is that true? Also, she says the devil wants us to. She wants us all to social distance. Accurate, yay or nay? More nay than yay. But um, uh, if she's, but there's always listen. There's always some truth in most errors. All right. There, I mean, in other words, in in every in every statement, there's a truth and there's an error, and you need to not just say it's all crap and where you know you try to find the truth. The truth there, of course, is yes. The devil wants us to be panicky. He does. It does want us to be really, really scared, just just frightened. You know, if uh, you know uh, somebody was telling me they were in a they were in a grocery store and somebody. F- and another aisle sneezed, and people screamed at them, mm. "Get out of here!" Mm. You know that's panic. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's that's so. I mean, there's there's a, uh, a there's a, it's true that the devil wants us to panic, uh, but uh, by and large, I mean, let, let's face it, eighty uh, percent of you, you young and healthy people, eighty percent of you, uh, if you catch, you either won't catch it, or if you catch it, it'll be very mild, and yet you could spread it to the people who will die from it. And there's a significant number of people who could. So it's, it, I would say that it's more nay than yay. It's, uh, it's not thinking of loving my neighbor, basically. Uh, but they, uh, there's, there is a lot of those, there's a lot of narratives out there. And one of the problems I do think for, and this would be another subject that we may get to next time, I hope we will, is that um, uh, we are all the target of, I would say, political actors who what they want to do is in every new situation that comes up, we say, okay, how can we make this work for us? Now, that's okay. I mean, it's, we're Christian ministers, and we're, we, want, we, we, we want to say, how do we use this as an opportunity to love people? How do we use this as an opportunity to lift up Jesus? I mean, so that's okay. But I do think there's, there's a political operatives who are trying to say, how do we let the virus basically uh, support what we've been saying all along? And there's, there's a lot of mistrust of the media. So, for example, I think uh, there are certain political uh, operatives that are using this as a way of saying, see, you just can't trust the media. Uh, there's, uh, there are also political operatives that, that say we need to, in, we need to increase the, the nation state and move towards socialism. So they're using this as, oh, okay, this is our opportunity to get to socialism. So it bothers me when I see the, the same liberal conservative political groups trying to use the virus to get their followers even more agitated, mm-hmm. and I'm afraid that might be what's happening to her. Yeah. So be nice to her. Yeah. Okay. Final question, okay. and just just briefly, because uh, we're just we're out of time. But uh, of course, this is questioning Christianity. This is for those that are considering what it means to maybe be a, become a Christian or wrestling with the Christian faith. What is the role of the Christian right now in the midst of COVID-19? What would, what would be some of the things you may want to share about the church's role in this season? Um, I actually do think that moderation is important because there really are voices, there are panicky voices and there's voices that say it's all a hoax. Moderation is very important because the reality is obviously the virus isn't a hoax. It's also true that for most healthy young people who probably are not likely to be really hurt by it, for them to, uh, to for them to give up a lot of privileges in order to save the more vulnerable populations, that's very Christian, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. It certainly certainly feels like Good Samaritan to me. Mm-hmm. I mean, the Good Samaritan, uh, he is the he. Remember, <clears throat> the man is dying in the road. There's robbers around. There's a priest and a Levite to go by because it, it's it's risky. And there's one guy that stops, the Good Samaritan. It feels to me like what we're doing when you talk about um, the virus is when, when young and healthy people who probably aren't in much danger pull themselves in and really uh, restrict themselves in a lot of way, constrain themselves in a lot of way for the, uh, the more vulnerable, that's important. Now, Christians can actually, a lot of people are doing that whether they're Christians or not. But Christians can actually call each other to do it and actually say, this is actually, a, this is very much a Good Samaritan thing. It's very much a Christ-like thing. I, I also think, uh, we, we'll see, but I do think that people are uh, looking for folks who are willing to say, trust but weep. 
because there's a, there's a legalism that says, well, if you just trust God, you won't be upset at all, you won't be staying in, you know, you won't be upset. And there's other people who are just weeping and feel like there's no hope. But, this, but the, the idea, no, there is a God here. There is a plan. At the same time, it's okay to weep. It's okay to be really upset. Mm -hmm. That, I think, Christians have the resources for that, and it's something that people need. And it's, I'm not sure a lot of the other worldviews have the resources for that. Hmm. I'll leave it there. Thank you for that. Uh, that's all the time that we have uh, for all of the questions. Thank you so much for sending them in. We're very grateful for your participation. Uh, just a couple of quick things before we go. First, uh, for those who are local here in, in New York with us, uh, we hope that you'll be able to come out to our next session, which is on Thursday, April 16th. Uh, Timmy, if you could just tell us a little bit about what that next session will be. Yeah. Um, can we do without the church? Right now, by the way, it's interesting. Can we do without the church? Uh, we're actually not sure whether we, we will be at West 83rd Street mm -hmm. or not. We may be live streaming again. Yep. Um, but the question that constantly comes up when I'm talking to, to people, as you know, is uh, a lot of people say, I'm, I'm kind of okay with Jesus, but the church, no way. And so that raises two questions. How can you even believe in the plausibility of the faith in light of the wrongdoings of the church over the years? And then secondly, is it possible to be then a Christian and not really have anything to do with the church? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so we will be looking at that next time. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, if you're interested in that topic, you can register at redeemer.com slash QC2020. Uh, make sure that you register, uh, especially to make sure that you're up to date on, as, as Tim mentioned, uh, how we'll actually be presenting that. We'll have to see what happens. Uh, but again, thank you guys for so, so much for joining us, and uh, we hope to see you in the future.